So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining. Uh, today we have Malini Krishnankuti. She is our, our guest this week. She's an architect and an urban planner based in Mumbai. And she's an adjunct associate professor at the Center for Urban Science and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. So uh, Malini, thank you so much for, for being here with us and you can start whenever you're ready. Great. Um, so um, I think, thank you very much for this opportunity to, uh, to talk about India, uh, you know, in, to the students there. And uh, it's always uh, very special uh, to, to be able to see how one can connect to other contexts. And I think, especially in the global south, uh, there is a lot we have to learn from each other. And, uh, you know, thank you very much for this. Um, so um, when uh, Samantha asked me about uh, talking about informality and law and, um, um, uh, you know, and, and asking whether I, she could use the piece that I had written on Panvel, uh, which is just outside Mumbai, uh, for a minute I was not very sure, um, you know, uh, in the sense that I was thinking, um, you know, may, should I, uh, because I have done some presentations on housing and, uh, you know, uh, other, other kinds of looking at informality more straight on. And I was wondering whether I should try and see what I can send across um, to do, uh, to see, to, to be able to easily connect and talk about informality uh, in both our contexts. But um, but then I, uh, on rereading it, I thought it's also an interesting opportunity to explore um, how planning, um, planning practice in a sense, you know, is itself um, brings in a certain kind of informality. And so um, what I'm going to do today, um, I have a lot of slides, but I'm, I'm going to skim through them. Uh, just so that you get a flavor of, um, you know, flavor of the place that I'm talking about, and then maybe we can we can discuss uh, details uh, later. So um, what I'll do is uh, uh, share um, share my screen and. Um, and. Um, let me just. Minimize. Yeah. So um, you know what I'm going to do is um, I'm I'm looking at um, you know so on on the right what you're seeing on the screen is uh, Mumbai metropolitan region. Um, it's actually now increased um, to include Palga. Okay. So it's added. It's become even bigger uh, as a metropolitan region. Um, and um, uh, it went up from about uh, 400 odd um, uh, square, um, 4,000 odd square kilometers to about 6,000 odd kilometers. So it's really grown. And uh, we are going to look at a transformation. So this is Mumbai. I, I hope you can see my, um, my uh, mouse, um, my arrow. And uh, so this is Mumbai. And uh, the area we are talking about is right here in Panbe. Okay. So that's what that's what we're looking at, um, and um, you know, like I said, so there is. Um, if one looks at informality and we look at planning, we see that informality typically, you know, we talk about its manifestations, which is um, the settlements, uh, informal settlements, informal livelihoods, vending, street vending, and so on. That are not, and and these are related to how law and um, law looks at. Uh, the formalization or the informalization of, uh, of uh, settlements and it's directly linked to access to property, right? So that is one kind of informality. The other, which is, and which is what this presentation is about, is, to, is looking at planning regimes, you know? And um, Ananya Roy is one of the earliest who talks about how planning itself is informal, that planning in India, India cannot plan her city, she said very famously, because it, it's marked by informality. And I, this presentation, in a sense, um, you know, I take apart the what constitutes planning, uh, and I take it apart and I say that maybe we need to look at one part of this planning practice as a sovereign practice, one that a higher state, you know, 
um, kind of imposes on the technical practice of the planner. And, uh, you know, what the paper talks about is how one place on the periphery of Mumbai, it's within the Mumbai metropolitan region, but it's largely a rural area, and how that area is actually sees a cocktail, you know, really a, a mix of infrastructure and planning projects that come onto it from above, from through, through sovereign intervention and the transformation that happens on the ground, which is, um, which, is, which is a result of this very uncoordinated, fragmentary planning um, that, um, that exists. And um, uh, what we find is uh, it's, it's an infrastructure-led planning. So you would expect it to be actually much more coordinated, but it's driven from a state or state level or a federal level planning action, largely infrastructure, and, and what you see is um, that there is a certain informality that it that is there because it's not, you expect it to be coordinated and it's not. And there is there, there's such a big, there is a difference between this kind of spatial planning practice, which I call technical planning and the political or the bureaucratic decision-making, which I'm calling technical um, uh, sovereign planning. And as a result, what you see is that there's a transformation of land that happens on the ground. Uh, 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 and the entrepreneurial state kind of, um, you know, the policies that come in are in order to, in, to open up the land. And this works against the practices or the, um, the, the comprehensive view that urban planning has. Um, whereas, you know, the state seems to think that it can inject certain projects um, onto, onto the into a place. And um, so these are the things that the paper is trying to detail out. Um, also, you see in this regional plan context for Mumbai, a largely urban bias of spatial planning, that it doesn't actually know how to uh, take this rural, this agrarian context on board. Okay, so that's what the paper is talking about, these contradictions that come in when sovereign planning, which is state action, state projects, infrastructure projects, come and land into a context which is already has a regional plan in place, but the regional plan has already come and it's a 20 year horizon and then these projects arrive and then things transform on the ground. And there's this, there's this informal uh, way in which things unfold on the ground, right? So um, this is just to give you a sense of, um, you know, where where is that one veil that I'm talking about? The gray is um, is uh, Mumbai right here. Uh, this, this is Greater Mumbai. And this metropolitan region has 17 urban local bodies within it and a thousand villages, okay? So just to give you that context, the, uh, the population is 12.4 million. Um, of Mumbai itself, 438 square kilometers, whereas Mumbai metropolitan region was 4,254 square kilometers, now grown to about 6,000 uh, square kilometers, and the population was 22.8 million. Uh, Panvel, well, I, I call this Peri Panvel because it's a small municipality of Panvel uh, town of 12 square kilometers. Uh, again, this the boundaries of this of this town have now been increased, but. Essentially, the area that we're talking about is just outside Old Panvel Town, and it's right here. And you can already see this big web of infrastructure that uh, is drawn onto that land. Okay, um, just to give you a sense of transformations that happen. So you have, uh, um, you know, just outside Panvel Station, you see that there was a new, uh, new airport that comes in. There is a connection to Mumbai, the Mumbai Trans Harbour Link that comes in uh, crossing Thane Creek. Um, but the big transformation for Mumbai happened in the late 90s when the train link, you know, the suburban train link um, brought Panvel closer. So this is what I'm saying. The first impetus was in the late 1990s, uh, 1998 to be precise, when a suburban railway extension brought, became, made Panvel the last suburban station on the suburban line. And that's when you start seeing um, afford uh, people fly, uh, buying and investing in uh, both investing in in uh, 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 flats 
in, in apartments in uh, Panvel, in and around Panvel. And also you see migrants searching for affordable housing. You, you find people coming there for affordable housing. The second impetus comes uh, 10, day, 10 years later when the announcement of the second international airport happens. And the third comes a yet another decade later with the regional plan. Now there is a hub uh, of, of, of big change. You know, a re, uh, Panvel is seen as a, um, as a big uh, uh, regional center. So there's this continuous, with every decade, you see some new thing, uh, an urban growth center, uh, being manufactured out of this uh, suburban area, right? So just to give you a, um, that in that first decade when a suburban train comes in, you see about 3,000 applications for residential, commercial, industrial, applications for change of permission, for development permissions that happened. And uh, you know, that's just to give you a sense. Uh, and the early 90s is when the most of it comes. And then later on, it's quite steady uh, over each decade. Um, just to give you a sense of that network, now there is, uh, and what is planned, you know, a lot of road, this is all um, road network existing and new ones uh, being shown in red. Uh, here are new railway connectivities being shown here on the left. So, um, and very interestingly, once the new airport gets declared in 2008, a whole new region, even bigger than Mumbai, uh, is Put out this is encompassing 500 villages you know is now taken up for um, a regional plan and the area is called uh, Nena. So you have spatial planning areas being uh, being marked uh, uh, you know saying that now with the airport there's going to be a lot of pressure we need to develop this land. So there is the new new Mumbai Navi Mumbai airport influence notified area and then, then that then gets kicked in. And um, many, many, many infrastructure plans that come in after the regional plan. Okay, so between two regional plans, you see there's a Trans Harbor link that I talked about, uh, Mum Delhi Mumbai infrastructure corridor, a multimodal corridor, uh, a separate metro network. The port itself is now expanding. Um, a major train terminus proposed near the existing railway station and expanding suburban rail networks. So it's a crazy, crazy situation and you soon start seeing in the papers a lot of these new projects. Now this is an agrarian setup, paddy fields, okay, but this is what is suddenly being promoted in this area. Does the village have the, um, does, uh, you know, the capability to, uh, to manage this kind of growth is another question. Uh, so this, these are the real problems on the ground. Um, these are the scale of transformation. You can see the kind of uh, huge 33 floor apartment buildings that are coming up, but no network infrastructure, no sanitation, no water, there are power cuts, you know, all of that. Um, these are the kinds of ads saying that this is just 10 minutes away from Mumbai. This land now because of the new MTHL corridor. So I'm just showing you some old Google images, you know, huge tra transforming landscapes suddenly. Um, this is showing you the extent of agri, you know, how much of agriculture. So as you go further away from Mumbai, you can see darker and darker shades, which is where there's intense agriculture happening. In this area, you can see the transformation happening, moving to a lighter shade because of the um, uh, change. And this is just to give you context. Now you have on the left, here you see a very tiled roof, small building. That's what it is. Now this landowner, uh, in the village is going to build these kinds of big, um, uh, big uh, apartment buildings on his um, land. And these are the kinds of access into the village. Okay, so things are transforming very, very rapidly uh, in Adai village. Um, just to give you a sense, you know, there's no garbage collection. There's no, the village is not, doesn't have the infrastructure capability uh, to, to manage this growth. A lot of construction happening, people changing jobs from becoming from farm, farming to construction to transport related activities. Okay, the fields around are not being uh, uh, worked upon anymore. A lot of construction happening. The transformation of this village, you can see the village now 
all around it for about 200, 500 meters, you're seeing this kind of very dense growth. Uh, a huge a huge apartment complex that actually has more people in it than uh, the village itself uh, in Nere village. Okay, so just to give you brick kilns that, you know, fields are now transformed into producing bricks for this construction industry. Uh, and about 30 kilometers away, you have people who are coming from a tribal village, uh, 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 tribal uh, settlement. Uh, they, come in, they come and work on these brick kilns and they, their jobs also uh, and their lands also are transforming even 30 kilometers further. Um, so this is the kind of landscape that was there, and, and you know that is also transforming. So just to give you the extent of transformation um, in MMR, yeah, just that last land use change, um, you know, in each decade, what was happening. I don't know if it's visible, but there are these spots of blue all around, which is how you know on the fringes of the red are a lot of blue. So that's the kind of transformation on the ground. It's affecting agriculturalists, tribals, and there are a lot of new people coming in to make a uh, lot of migrant labor in, in, this, in this area. And it's telling us uh, also that it's a result of a very fragmented planning apparatus. Um, uh, and it's telling you, um, like I said earlier, that there's a difference between a technical planning input and a sovereign planning uh, input, uh, which is very much top down and um, just often even our spatial policies that create change on the ground. Um, and it's, it's actually an entrepreneurial state which is working against urban planning uh, in one sense here. Uh, it's not taking the regional plan into account. And uh, so really, you know, the question is that having such a fragmentary planning apparatus, it kind of prevents any kind of coordinated um, action and uh, also in this kind of very urban setting, you find that there is no cognizance, even urban planning as a, even the technical plan in a sense, uh, doesn't really know how to address this, the rural, okay? And uh, finally, um, you know, the uh, question is, can, can planning really engage with or steer this new urbanization that's happening because it's finally being led through a project or infrastructure uh, uh, through infrastructure projects and and that too without any participatory process. So can really, my question is, can, can planning really engage with or steer this urbanization? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I, <clears throat> those were, you know, just to give you the context of what I was talking about uh, uh, in, in, a, in a place which is an hour away by suburban train from Mumbai, okay? And, and the surrounding villages outside of Pandel um, station. So that's the context we are talking about. Governance wise, it is, they're not, it's not a municipality, but it's villages. So village panchayat areas, okay. Right, thank you. Thank you, Malini. That was, uh, yeah. I think, so helpful. Uh, it, it is nice also to see some of the images of, of the places that uh, we read in the in the article. I, I thought that uh, unless I don't know, maybe first, is there any any question or any clarification or any reaction by anybody? Because I was thinking about making maybe a, a couple of questions so we can maybe are be in the same page. But is there anything? on the part of the students that uh, would like to ask or add or comment on this first part of the, the session. Let's see, let's just uh, give, I'll give you some seconds maybe. It's always hard, the first question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe just to, to start a, a, a little bit in the conversation, I was thinking that uh, it's interesting and I think useful, and I'm thinking about uh, that in the case of Peru, this di distinction between uh, sovereign planning and technical planning. Um, for example, here in Peru, uh, there is the discussion about who is uh, planning the development of the city. Is it the urban planners 
or is it maybe the uh, sanitation and uh, sanitation infrastructure companies that are not formally doing planning, but they are actually saying where the water is going to be, and that's where the people are going to go, for example. That, that's what comes to my mind. But I was maybe wanting for you to maybe explain a little bit what are, uh, were you uh, thinking about examples of that type of sovereign planning in the article, for, for example, you mentioned even uh, not only policies, uh, infrastructural plans, but also projects, for example. So would you consider also that a project like the airport will be the government doing or the sovereign or the politicians doing planning? Uh, that's an interesting distinction between sovereign planning and technical planning that I think it's an interesting framework to, to start thinking of some things that are also happening in Peru as well. So perhaps maybe you could explain that a little bit more and, and then we can go with the with the conversation. So, um, you know, actually, um, I think this is, in, in India, the conversation about planning has always been that planning, um, you know, plans are great, implementation is terrible. That's what we hear. That means plans are pretty much ineffective, you know. The only thing they seem to do is regulate development, the formal development. So they have a set of codes, they have some regulations, and then you know they control the formal development. The informal settlements are happening on their own, and they they are not trying. Then there is no nothing to do with the plan. Well, there is this kind of thinking. Um, so when I looked at when I, when I you know uh, when I was looking at what is this practice of planning, uh, you find that actually the, the the plan has no funds attached to it. It also doesn't have projects, so it is not concretizing any project, nor is it concrete. It is not, and it doesn't have any funds. So it is meant only as a tool of regulating land use. And naturally, obviously, it is not very effective because the few reservations it has, as in terms of projects, it only reserves land for public amenities. Uh, but realizing a, a, a social amenity like a school or a, or a hospital, or even um, it may reserve land for a future airport or a widen a road. So that's all it's doing. It's just reserving land for future use. And to that extent of social amenities, it is trying to redistribute resources um, in an equitable way in the city. Um, but because it doesn't have projects and outlined as priorities, uh, it doesn't end up, uh, you know, it's, it's used only by the formal, um, by people who are building formally in the city to get their plan passed. So it becomes this paper document automatically in one sense that is not looked at when there are projects imagined. Because for all state projects, the state is the state, which means the federal or the provincial government is putting out the, both the project and the money. And at that point, the state is not referring to that plan document, which was supposed to be a synthesizing comprehensive document anyway. So, you know, I've written about this saying that it is a complete marginalization of spatial planning. The way this is structured, that there is, where there is a plan, there is no money. And where there is money, there is, um, like we also have federal funding for schemes and projects, you know. So you'll have this, um, you'll have a, a, a very big fund for um, upgrading services in all our cities, um, the JNNURM. So for 63 cities, there was money for infrastructure, what you just said, water, sanitation, um, you know, may heritage buildings, uh, housing, even housing, some um, upgradation. So there was money, huge money that came in and there was, it was not attached to any of these plans. So, you know, this complete, this, this juncture in a sense that tells you that projects come and land and then they do their own thing. And so what is the purpose of the spatial plan is what I was, you know, thinking. Um, so, that's, um, so that's when I started questioning the logic of 
you know, and separating what I see as sovereign planning. Doesn't mean that the technical, you know, the technical is embedded in the sovereign. It is a state profession, but they don't talk to each other, the projects and the plan. So, yeah, so, you know, that's, uh, that's how most of Indian projects are funded centrally or through state government, very rarely through municipal budgets because municipalities have no budget. Right. Very, right. Low, very less, right. only to, uh, to run the water or even for that, sometimes they don't have uh, money. So, yeah, it's, right. it's a very strange situation. Yeah, it's strange, but perhaps it's interesting. It's, uh, I will say again, similar to what some of the discussions that we, we have here. In, in the case of Peru, for example, the plans do include uh, a set of projects that there was something new in the framework of how to do urban plans in the 2010s, for example. They do include a set of projects, uh, strategic projects for the cities. But still, they don't have a specific money to fund those projects, and um, and there is and this is something that uh, we had this experience working in the government with Samantha. Uh, there is the situation that these plans uh, are usually done by the go local governments, but somehow the advice in those plans is made by the Ministry of Housing and Urbanism. That's the sector that is in charge of the urban plans. Whereas the funding of the projects, the design of the methodologies of how to design these infrastructural projects is something that depends on a different sector, which is the Ministry of Finance. And uh, even though we wanted to maybe make that connection, the Ministry of Finance and the people working in finance and in infrastructure and in strategic planning, they have a framework that doesn't necessarily take into account the a spatial deployment of things in, in the practice. So even though we try to maybe make that connection, for example, during the during the time the, that we had in the government, there was lots of um, skepticism for for this, or lots of uh, responses in a negative way from the people in the finance world because they are looking to indicators. Maybe they are looking. To, so I very much relate to the to the stuff. <laughs> Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. so uh, again, maybe I will keep maybe asking questions or uh, speaking uh, because I have a couple of comments too. But maybe I'll I will open it uh, either Samantha if you want to make a, any comment or the students if you have any question or comment that you want to do uh, about the presentation of Malini. Let's give the students first a chance. Otherwise, I I can also. Timing. Otherwise, I'll think that the students didn't read or understand. Unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> nah, it was too this. opaque. It was too opaque, was it? I hope not. No, I'm, can you I'm turn on your videos? <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish you will turn your videos, uh, uh, guys, so so Malini can can meet you. I, I believe they they have uh, read. We have a forum in the in the web page of the class. Where they put some quotes of the of the readings, I see there that people, at least from what I see, paid more uh, more attention to this distinction between sovereign planning and technical planning, and also to the discussion in relation to urban and rural and the commodification of rural. Maybe that's something that we want to talk. But uh, yeah, but again, I'll give some 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 time for people to just uh, uh, come in and want to if you if you want to comment or ask something. If not, maybe. Uh, I think Samantha and I will be happy also to do it's some It's nice work. to see Claudia turning on her video. Thank you. Anyone else? It's nice. I mean, I really don't get to see anybody from South America. So it's uh, it's really special to... Yes, Claudia. Hi. Uh, well, I have a little question about Mumbai. Well, if, for example, here in Lima, we have a plan that... It's a plan for metropolitan of urban development for 2021 and 2040 in Peru. And it's a plan that uh, the, that have a lot of metropolitan terms of the district of Lima. Um, for the, in that plan, it's talk about uh, transport, living, housing, and uh, 
it's about the expansion of Lima to the other areas. Um, for that, I would like to know if, for example, in Mumbai, about the this there are these kind of plans are, are thinking for the city or in, in this case for the expansion of the city for not only for these years, you know, in the future. Uh, that's my question. Okay, great question. So I have worked on both the Mumbai development plan and on the regional plan. Um, so, um, uh, and both happened, the development plan for Mumbai happened first, um, 2016 to 2036. And then the regional plan came out shortly after. Um, it should have been reversed. You, you first have a regional framework and then you have the, um, the, the city uh, to follow. But uh, of course, you know, we are uncoordinated. <laughs> so it happened reverse, as always. Uh, we had a transportation plan that came even later. You know, should have happened first. But um, so these things are beautifully not coordinated. Um, but in terms of what you asked me about expansion, so, you know, the metropolitan region, like I said, it already has 17 urban local bodies. And it has a thousand villages. So what we, we what we've done is we have expanded the municipal governance area of each of these municipalities. Is it clear? Or is it getting broken up? No. Yeah, it's clear that for example, he, here in Peru, the, this plan that I took is does the, the a lot of people doesn't know about, for example, even politics doesn't know completely about this plan. Um do, doesn't take care about in her policies when they try to when they want to become an authority, they don't take care about this plans that in the plan of the metropolitan urban of development state. So uh, it's kind of difficult to, to uh, how do you say, compare these plans? Sorry. Compare? Compare the two? Yeah, it's actually very, uh, Implement, I will say. Just yeah, what exactly was saying, the implementation <laughs> part of the plan. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. hard to implement these plans if the authorities doesn't know completely about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. ah, okay, so I would say, like I said earlier, Claudia, you know, we have um, we have some very futuristic. I feel like in this uh, final regional plan, they came up with um, you know they came up with uh, growth centers. Okay some 10, uh, let me just find that page. Um, in fact, I can also send you a link to this report. You, you can take a look at it if you're interested. Um, so there is this wonderful page, 10 growth centers. I don't know if it's clear, okay. 10 growth centers are marked. Can you see it? Yeah, I think yeah, we can see it. You can see some parts which are then expanded, okay? So 10 growth centers, now these are very, very rural. And you're seeing this, this, these parts, I was part of this plan, but this was one thing which I was not very comfortable with. Um, it happened, um, you know, the studies for this happened by a separate unit. Um, and they said, oh, we should have, this is where three transportation corridors are intersecting. This is where there's government land. Um, this might be a good place to develop as a industry, as an industrial hub or something like that. Um, whereas the reality is that this area is seeing manufacturing flee. Uh, they are leaving because the land is very, very expensive. In the, in the city, and this region is not having manufacturing anymore. But our, you know, our plans are showing that we will we will develop it from outside. And I think, um, you know, when you uh, my experience has been that when you force as a planner, you imagine in your head that this will happen. 
it's very hard to implement. It's not something that the ground forces, you know, that, that, that economic mm -hmm. activity is not automatically embedded and there already. If you want to boost something which is there, yes, great. But when you artificially come and try to say, put uh, on a plan because it looks wonderful, mm -hmm. when you do that, it's, it's very hard to, to create this, right? So that's the, uh, I mean, so implementation of a plan, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, unless you have um, a participatory process, then you have projects and you have funding, it's not possible to implement anything is what I would say. Um, you know, with a plan, usually we rarely have a participatory process. Um, then we rarely have funding. So two out of three things, we have a plan. Uh, we don't have two out of the three ingredients that we need uh, to implement a plan, you know. So that's just to tell you. Uh, and when we see something naturally that people are doing, you know, informal work, people have found that this is the place to, to bend. This is the place, you know, um, then planners don't seem to like that informality. And they're trying to regulate it. They're trying to stifle it. They're trying to move it. They're trying to formalize it. And they want it to look good. So, you know, I, I, I also think that there is a need to rethink order, the order that we as planners want to impose uh, on a landscape, that this looks good. You know, a plan is an ordered control of the landscape, uh, which I think is at the heart of planning and goes counter to what informal work or informal living uh, is trying to uh, do. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I actually have uh, one more question regarding maybe plans and maybe I think we can later move on a little bit to what you were just mentioning about informality and how that plays a part and how that's conceived in, in India and how that also relates to, to like the planning uh, apparatus, let's say. Uh, so you mentioned, for example, for Mumbai, you have different kinds of plans. You mentioned a regional plan, the transportation plan. And if I understood correctly, they are, uh, they are a 20 year plan. Like the, the, right. the time frame for the plan is like 20 years. Um, and I was curious, uh, that's something that I've uh, maybe been, been questioning in, uh, recently is, is that maybe time frame what makes it so hard to implement? Like thinking that we will know what will happen 20 years from now, that and and thinking that we know what will happen without taking into consideration maybe like the political economy or the economical uh, considerations uh, being taken in this sovereign planning, for example. Um, like, what do you? Maybe what do you think about that relationship between the, the time scale of the plan, the implementation process, and how that relates to, to sovereign planning? Great, great question. Um, so I think, um, you know, I've also um, been rethinking, you know, uh, urban planning processes, you know, having worked at all the scales. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's very interesting that the transportation plan, 20 year horizon, um, has worked fantastically in Mumbai. Right now we are in the midst of nine metro lanes, all lines getting implemented simultaneously, supposed to have been implemented over 20 years. Happening at the same time, the whole city is dug up. Okay, so why is that? Because I think it feeds right into, uh, you know, huge, you know, World Bank, ADB, everybody wants to fund this, right? Um, they And the political uh, leadership wants to uh, show that they have succeeded. They have transformed the city. So, uh, you know, all visions come together. Everybody's uh, ideas of what they want from the project Except that people who are living here, uh, lives are miserable because you can't 
travel, go through the city. And then they have this very nice uh, thing saying, sorry for all the trouble, but you know, it's for a better future, right? <laughs> so your current, uh, your immediate time in, in, in Mumbai is hell, but you know, please, please hold on. You know, it's only for this wonderful vision of the, uh, of the future, of this beautiful future that's going to come. And um, so, um, so, you know, but, but so it's very interesting that a project, especially the, the more expensive the project, it's sure to be done. It's sure to get executed. So we have this uh, one lakh, uh, I don't know how to put it in, in, do, in, in dollars, but we have this bullet train that's going to come connecting two cities, Mumbai and Ahmedabad, uh, whose budget uh, is more than what we spent on that 63 city uh, transformation budget. One bullet train. So, you know, um, so it's a very, very sad, um, you know, commentary that I think this is the case world over that transport projects, infrastructure projects, and I think Flibberg, uh, Flibberg work, Flibberg's work, Ben Flibberg talks to us about high, large infrastructure and risk, right? He's always talking about um, how they're over, uh, they're sold, you know, uh, telling us that it's it's a great future and you know it's it's going to all work. Uh, but in reality, of course, it's, you know, the, the real story is something else that the real risks and the real problems and the real costs are not calculated. And so I think uh, transport, so so I don't think it's a horizon, frankly. I don't think it's a 20 year period. Um, I think you need a large horizon, but at the same time, you, you have to review every five years, you know, and then keep being flexible, you know, is it possible to say that this we thought, but it's not working? Can we shift? And I don't know. I mean, I think um, I, I keep talking about Purichiba as one, one success story because they were flexible. Um, you know, I have experienced that firsthand that they, they implement a short part, test it, and then they're not, they're not, uh, they're not unwilling to say that um, it's not working. And let's modify it, you know? So I feel that if we can be nimble somehow with our planning and accept that we, we don't have all the answers. And I think you're right that, you know, we don't even know what the next five years are going to look like. We didn't know that COVID is going to hit us, you know? Um, so obviously uh, things are there, and especially with climate change, I think it's going to be so different uh, how do we plan in this context? So we just hopefully say that, you know, we project something, but we need to really keep moving every five years and every year kind of see and track. And today it's possible for us to track real change. You know, we have the technology um, if, we, if we want. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In India, we, we don't share data. We don't share data across departments. So, <laughs> you know, it's very hard to plan. Uh, we don't have data um, uh, because people hold on to data as if it's it's something very personal. They don't share with consultants. They want consultants to plan for them, but they won't share it with you. So it's a very uh, unfortunate uh, situation. You know, I, I think, so I, I don't think it's really the time period, but I think it's, uh, it's probably got to do with uh, not being able to change or not willing to accept defeat. You know, that's something, a failure. Like if something is not working, not even having the courage to say this was not working, we thought it would work, but let's shift course, no? Um, yeah. Okay. okay, let's see if uh, we maybe can have another round of um, comments or questions from anyone. Yeah, I think it'll be nice to hear from the students. You know, what you think. Um, and I think um, also the nature of informality in, in India, you know, I think half, more than half of our city lives in informal settlements um, in Mumbai. So we are 12 and a half million um, and it's actually, 55% or something is what they say officially, but it's actually much more than that. Um, 
and in many wards of Mumbai, we have one. We are touching one million per ward, so it's like small cities in themselves, no. And sometimes even as much as eighty-five percent are living in in slums, in informal settlements. So it's it's quite. Uh, to to those um, to those areas or to uh, that uh, part of the people in Mumbai, what what's what you will say is the policy or the stance of the government, even though it might be more complicated than that, I think you will say in Peru or in Lima, the position is, well, that's not part, that's not a, an issue of, of urban planning. That's an issue of land titling, for example, maybe just simplifying a lot uh, what the stance of the right, government, right. Will be, but maybe that's what you will say, for example, in the case of Lima, is that something similar yeah. in the case of in uh, India. In India in general? Yeah. Maybe? yeah. So, so in in Mumbai, it's a, it's a different. Uh, it's it's become very complex uh, because the land holding pattern in in uh, Mumbai is uh, is such that you know um, what shall I say that very few people own more, a lot of the land. So that's one reality. Um, the second thing is that a lot of the that 50% of the uh, of the informal settlements are on government property and 50% are not so the 50% that is not are actually often on lands that are reserved in the development plan for an amenity they're induced by landowners they've given them that plot to prevent the land being taken over Uh, for a particular amenity by government, because at a, at that time when the DP 91 came in, um, it was land that uh, it, the government would have taken at a very low price. So they didn't want to give up that land for public amenity. So they induced um, informal settlements on that land. So you you have this strange uh, case of settle of of informal settlements. On specific parcels of, of land, uh, either which are government lands or which are non-governmental lands, but they are there for a long, long time. Um, and now there is this. Um, since 1995, you have a, a, a all areas which are declared slums come under the slum redevelopment authority. And they try to make this different parcels of land. Uh, they try. They have promised them free housing through market intervention, and that's where the problem lies. Because what they have done is they have given huge incentives to the uh, to the developer to build an equal number of flats for sale. So on the same plot of land, you have double and triple densities and for the slum component there is no light and ventilation the building codes are also relaxed so you kind of condemn them to these high rise slums which are which have no light and ventilation and have become uh, places where there are there is there are drug resistant tb now you know, places which are so difficult and also not well serviced and which are going to go into crime maybe, you know, for the first time, we never had slum communities with crime. We did not have slum communities with drugs, okay? But slowly these things are changing because there is a sense of despair in these high rises that are now coming. And the latest, uh, I just saw that a 33-story slum rehab building has been proposed. Um, you know, the, there's, it's being, uh, it was advertised as the tallest slum rehab building in the world. Uh, you know, as this, but you can imagine that these have pocket-sized flats, 250 square meters, uh, square feet, very, very tiny, in which families, you know, are five and Uh, seven and more sometimes live, you know, it's very, very sad, actually. Um, so, in fact, you don't need to stack them up like that. And um, so, you know, the slum uh, policy here is really, it's a very terrible policy of condemning people to these ghettos. 
And uh, you know, this policy of TDR, it's called slum TDR, transfer of development rights. You allowed um, properties to, to take their um, extra FSI, extra whatever was granted to them as development rights. They could move it to some place north of where they are. You know, so all these complex things, which meant that the poor were ghettoized in low value lands. And only the sale components were transferred to places which would give the builder more revenue. So very perverse outcomes, you know, very perverse, you know, unbelievably perverse outcomes have come out of the slum policy in, in Mumbai. So that's a whole, <laughs> you know, another place where I would say where policy interventions have come in and um, actually struck at the root of urban planning. Uh, where all planning considerations have been thrown out of the window. We don't have even national building code operating in Mumbai for informal settlers. You know, it's a very, very sad um, state of affairs. So, uh, because you want to grab the land which is, uh, which is occupied by, um, by informal settlements. You want to release it to the, um, to the market. And the state is allowing that and facilitating that under the guise of uh, slum resettlement. Sorry, we have gone, maybe moved away. I don't know. No, no, that's 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 super interesting. Uh, I think, uh, and and just on, on that, is it that the the problem is with the policy of doing that those redevelopments in the slums, or is it that the design of the of the developments is uh, the weak part of it? That's that's something that uh, because there might be some ways to maybe do some redevelopments that don't imply necessarily high rises in this kind of uh, yes. type of design that you've... Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, again, great question. You would think, you know, uh, what has happened is Mumbai's real estate is among the high, prices are among the highest in the world. And that is at the crux of all of this greed to monetize land and to, you know, if, if the land was not so expensive, uh, you would, um, like we have had wonderful public housing schemes in the past, in the 60s and the 70s. We have public housing, which is full of grace, which has, you know, land, which is open uh, grounds, very uh, ground plus three walk-ups, very nice. And those lands, and we have about 88 of these public housing schemes, uh, that the that the government is now trying to densify through these kinds of so this you know we have seen um, across uh, Mumbai wonderfully wonderful old public housing schemes now being um, now being labeled as uh, old derelicts and need for redevelopment. So the moment you put it under the redevelopment tag, you densify and re. Uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, put all these people who have been living there quite well for all of these years, for hundreds of years, um, you kind of now clump them together because they're poor into these uh, very, very uh, bad design, uh, badly designed uh, apartments. So it's a, it's a trend now. And uh, in fact, the whole city is going through a redevelopment um, phase. All yeah. the old buildings, with, yeah. So it's a it's a it's a moment where you know uh, this cap uh, this accumulation you know there's it's it's a frenzy because there's so much money to be made. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. In the in the session in the class we have uh, students from from architecture from design and also from law. So there 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 is a component of both things in the in the, this whole problem that you're describing that I think you, you could also think about that in in the case of Lima or in the case of Peru um yeah I saw that there were some other questions in the forum of us uh, around the the urban and rural and that process specifically about the article I don't know if anyone I saw there Hanno and Julissa question about uh, that topic or any other uh, thing that you guys want to comment or ask? Vanessa? Yeah, 
And uh, well, I would like to know if this case could be considered as a process of gentrification in Mumbai, uh, which uh, may be is happening in the name of a pro uh, progress or a development of the city. Um, so um, gentrification is happening. Uh, it's happening in Midlands, uh, in the heart of the city. Um, so we had, um, it was a textile mill hub at one time. Um, uh, Mumbai in, in the 1850s, uh, it started having its first textile mill uh, during British occupation. And um, till the 1980, till 1980, um, almost 100 years, you know, we had a lot of cotton uh, textile mills in the city and uh, the, the um, uh, textile workers were a big, uh, they were unionized and there was a very big uh, uh, part of the, of almost central Mumbai, you know, very close to the tip of the island you actually had a, uh, had a big presence of all of these textile mills. But in the 1980s, that, that saw the period of uh, the mills actually uh, saying that uh, it's difficult, um, you know, to keep, make production, make it to be productive in the city. Actually, it was a time when land values went up and the, um, these were leased lands from the government. And uh, what we found is that mill owners were, were waiting to, declare their mill sick and close the factory. And then they wanted the textile workers to leave. And there, there was also a lot of workers housing that was there around these areas. So there was this idea that the textile, actually these are government lands which were leased to the mills. So the moment the mills stopped functioning, it should have gone back to government. But instead the mill owners got into a very interesting arrangement with the state government not the municipality with the state government. And they made it such that the land actually almost completely with a very small percent of open land uh, uh, around the mills was, they, they played a little trickery. They were, it had gone to court and you know there were civil society movement uh, saying that this land has to come back to the people and so on. Anyway, so it so happens that they, that public, uh, that uh, people got a very small part of that, of those large mill lands in Mumbai. And uh, all of these mills have got transformed into commercial uh, developments, uh, some residential, but largely commercial, big malls, a uh, lot of uh, residential buildings, very high end, because they had large properties. So you will find cricket grounds, football grounds, you know, these exclusive gated communities have come up where the textile uh, mills were. The hardworking, you know, the, the core of Mumbai, in fact. Uh, so there's this transformation that's happened and all of those areas have got completely gentrified. You don't find what the, what we talked about in Panvel are rural, you know, the, the area that we're seeing is full. It was just paddy fields till 10 years ago. Okay, these families are still agrarian, you know, they still keep a patch of their land. They, they call their, their land mother earth, it's our mother. So there are people who are, you know, have that attachment to the land, they don't want to sell. Um, and yet they are without, you know, lands around them, a builder will corner, the water supply to their land is cut off. So it's, it's not really a gentrification process in, the, in this, because it is beyond even the suburb of Mumbai. It is the metropolitan region is very, very agrarian still in Mumbai. And what you find is that if you can reach an area by the suburban rail uh, within an hour or maximum two hours journey from Mumbai city, uh, you might still have job a job in Mumbai city or you are looking for a house uh, because housing is so unaffordable in Mumbai city that you will you are willing to commute two hours. But that kind of apartment building is um, is restricted to areas within walking distance of the suburban railway station. So it's, and then beyond that, it's fields. And that's a very, that's the kind of, that's what the pet metropolitan region looks like in, in, in Mumbai, around Mumbai. Okay. Uh, it's apartment, it is, um, it's kind of a suburb of Mumbai, suburban uh, developments because there is no affordable housing in Mumbai. So people are willing to commute Why 60% of the jobs are still within Mumbai. So, 
that's that's how it is. But Panvel is right now because it's booming with all the infrastructure. It's seeing a lot of migrant labor from other rural areas in India, people coming for work and building this infrastructure and living there. You know, so there's that kind of churn. People who are really desperate for jobs um, are living in Panvel. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Malini. Th there was uh, one uh, quote that uh, uh, one of the students, uh, Julissa, put in the forum that maybe I, I can read it quickly. It says, planners view uh, the agrarian periphery largely as a land bank. Uh, it, it was in the, in the article. Uh, yes. uh, there were a couple of other people also that that mentioned that uh, that interface into, in between the urban and the agrarian and how that was being commodified that how that land was being uh, made commercially available for either developments uh, infrastructure projects um so maybe could you speak a little bit of that that's more in the article but the commodification process of the land and also whether you have in mind uh, an alternative to that how could a different scenario will be where the land is not commodified will that what will that entail that would be interesting to just have your your i sure. don't know view on that yeah sure. so um you know if um so like i said i've been involved in planning you know both at the city level as well as at the regional level uh, and I've been on the planning at a state level uh, uh, to create a regional plan for an entire state uh, for Goa. Um, so what I found very interesting is that at all scales, the planner's view of land, you know, uh, or the planner's view of uh, development uh, was very much the idea they look at, you know, we, we talk about greenfield and brownfield. But in India, and I'm sure in most places, um, there is no real green field. Somebody is occupying that land and someone, whether it is human or non-human, there is an occupation, there is a way in which the land is there. Uh, but in the planner's mind, it is about acquiring that land. It is land as property. It is always to something that, you know, which I find very, even in law, you know, it's very interesting that you first want to establish whose property. And, um, you know, there is no conce conception of land outside of that property lens. So, uh, you know, it's always something you draw something on paper and then you want to say, um, uh, this 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 project of ours is so important for development. Very very um, uh, abstract, you know. It will be a growth center. It will bring jobs. It will do this. And for that, whoever is currently owning that land or doing something with it or having a livelihood around it, has simply will simply be given some compensation. And if they resist they are seen as evil. You know, they are seen as a problem. It cannot be that you have an atta attachment to the land. You know, when I spoke to people in Panvel, they were talking about land as their mother. It's a very direct kind of a link that they don't want to give up their land. And they said, we are being forced of, out of our land. But I think the planner's imagination of land is property. It is about a means to develop a means of development for the better. So there is already a sense that primary activity, you know, if it is growing food is less value than giving a job in a second, in a tertiary employment, you know, you'll put up something, an airport, you'll put up something else. There is no, you know, so I found that very, very actually shocking because you have, you know, um, uh, I had one map which said Nena, uh, five, uh, it said five, um, 526 villages have been, is the land demarcated for the new, you no, know, the notified area for uh, the international airport, that Nena uh, plan. Now, at the moment that land is drawn as an area for planning, in your mind, 
the fact that it's agricultural, it is low value. The planner thinks that he or she is going to give it more value. You know, so in a sense, I feel that, you know, it is, it is the view that I've encountered over and over again among planners, that they think through their action, they are going to give more value to the land. Um, you know, they're going to bring in economy. They're going to, whereas they don't see any value to what is already there, which is, you know, if the same thing happened to them living in the city, if somebody else comes and tells them what you are doing is not productive and I can make it much more productive, I don't think it will go well, you know. You will ask for compensation. You will say, you know, uh, you're putting me out of uh, this place. You know, there's so much because you be, you have a right of education, of 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 of, of being valuable, you know. And uh, so that's that's what I meant. That uh, there is a a, a very very um, it's almost as if if you're educated, you're already one up, and you will not till the land or there are all of these notions that these are uneducated farmers who can only plow the land and that has no value. Um, you know, we know, I mean, today we should know better that, you know, we are heading for food insecurity, we are heading for water uh, shortages, you know, in our context, especially productive land should be something that um, I feel we really need to value. And, that uh, that is just not there anywhere in the planning horizon uh, we don't seem to find that um, so that's one the other thing uh, which you said what is the way forward and i and i was wondering um, you know is there a way in which we can actually find the most unproductive lands and turn it over to housing you know something which nothing can grow on it you know nothing can it's really barren and and whereas in our planning terminology, we don't seem to find, we, it's, it'll be hard to actually find unproductive lands, you know? Um, uh, so uh, like this concept of living gently, these things are not entered planning, they have entered architecture. There is a sense of treading gently, but in planning, we don't have these notions of, of uh, at least in India for sure, we don't even think of the environment. Because environment, um, environmentally sensitive uh, areas or um, farmlands um, or rural are things that are have to give for development to happen. You know that binary uh, is there very much. So, uh, so I was saying like you know I think um, there have been a few cases where um, there is a trusteeship of like a common trust, uh, common land ownerships. Um, so, which I think may be one way forward, like why does property and why does property have to be in the name of one person? Can it be held in trust? Can there be a community owned? Like I think in the US, there are these models of community land trusts, uh, which, um, uh, you know, hold environmentally sensitive areas and in trust for, for long. Um, privately, they're private trusts, but they're holding it um, secure for the future. So I know in, uh, in uh, Western USA, there are these movements that land bank uh, for the future. Um, in, in, uh, in, a socialist, um, uh, in the socialist tradition in India, we used to land bank in planning. We used to land bank for the future, you know, for public housing. We stopped that. So we have, we used to mark uh, and we used to think that redistributing land um, and uh, you know providing housing for people was a public uh, good. Today, housing is not seen as a public good. Uh, you know, it's seen as a market, uh, uh, as something that is not an, not a public good and uh, cannot be provided by the state. So I think uh, you know even before we had before the colonial period, we had uh, uh, common ownerships of land all village land was common. Um, and it was then uh, given to people to work on. So I think we need to rethink this idea of private ownership of scarce resources. No? <laughs> so that's that's where I would take it. Right. Cool. Yeah. I like that you went there. <laughs> that's. I think that's the... <laughs> 
the way forward. And and I totally uh, plead guilty of the law of us lawyers when you when you approach. And that, I think that's useful for also for us uh, and the students of law here in the in the session when we do teach or practice property law the first question is um as you said like uh, who is the owner who i have to pay to and and that, <laughs> yeah. that, that bias in the in in law I, I totally say that it's like that and those are very ingrained and very structural things that maybe will take more time to to change but i think they are there so i, I think you've you've identified them very clearly so yeah Thank you for that, Malini. Maybe one one last uh, round of, of comments or anything on your side, uh, Samantha, to have maybe just a one one final part of the session. Yes, I don't know if the students have um, something to to add, but I uh, as Jose Carlos was saying, like you bringing this um, idea of trusteeship or communal ownership of of land and referencing how that was done before, but then it sort of stopped. Uh, I think that's very interesting because I think we, like there's several countries who may have similar issues that have been happening in this turn towards a more capitalist idea of uh, the market and the sort of common, thinking of housing or other things as commodities now right rather than as you were saying maybe a public good so i think that that's very interesting i think there's a question from from perla so uh perla do you want to go ahead yes i i had a question because um uh, can you hear me do, yes. do you guys hear me yeah okay so i i just i always thought before I, I like uh, read the article, like I remember that I always thought that uh, India and Lima wasn't very different, like uh, Mumbai, for example, like we had the same traffic uh, problems, we had the same uh, urbanization problems. And uh, it was just chaotic in general, just as much as Lima. So I, I thought it was very interesting. And now that I have like a very, like a uh, more informational insight about it, it's just, I, I can understand why we are so similar. Um, it's just about, we have no like uh, connectivity uh, with, uh, with transportation. Also like there's, um, there's this part where uh, th there's no protection of land, which I thought it was very different. It was very uh, interesting in the article, um, how, it's so fragmented as, as much as it, it, it is in Lima. So my question would be um, if if there is like a, a like a solution planned for Mumbai, I mean, if it could be implemented in Lima as well, could could it um, like if there's something that is um, getting into um, getting the process to be implemented in Mumbai or, or in India in general, and if it could be implemented in Lima as well, to, you know, to, uh, to fix this fragmentary um, um, view on, on Mumbai. Hmm. hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, multi-million dollar question, no? Good question. Sure. Uh, how do you fix this, right? How do you fix this fragmentation? Um, so there was, there's this very interesting process that um, uh, was called a people's um, a participatory spatial plan uh, that we had in the state of Kerala in south of India. Um, I can share that document with you. Um, so, you know, so what we have in, in India is um, you have the only the urban areas have spatial plans and the rural areas only have funding for projects and schemes. Um, so that's why I said where there is a spatial plan, there is no funding, where there is no spatial plan, there is funding for projects and schemes. So you know, that's how, so the rural versus the urban divide is there in the way economic planning uh, is set up in the country. 
So this person in um, this ex chief town planner of Kerala came up with this very interesting, um, you know, he looks at the administrative divisions uh, for the city, for the country, which is by districts. And then he, that's where the first level of funding is disbursed and then it goes into the villages. So he said, let's, and within the district, you also have the cities. So you have cities and, and uh, villages and, you know, the money for the villages are going through the districts. So he said the most important thing is to have at the district level a spatial integrated plan. So, and he uses that um, to, to filter all the funds and you know, identify all the projects. Uh, but at the same time, he, he has these very interesting institutional mechanisms to make sure that the spatial planning team and the elected representatives are on the same uh, team. And so they, are, they have to talk to the people, they have to come through a process, and then the spatial plan is actually taking the aspirations of the people and transforming it into projects. You know, so the, it's actually the institutional structure where the elected people, as well as the technical people, come together. Um, it, it's the only place where this was tried, and um, he was close to recommending it at to the national level. Um, in Kerala, in the state of Kerala, which is also quite unique, it is it's got the highest literacy rate the highest uh, human um, uh, HDRs and, and all of that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's done ex exceptionally well on the social indicators. Uh, and it also had the first elected communist government. So it's, it's, it's quite unusual. And it had, um, it used to have uh, land redistribution right after independence. So poverty is very low. Uh, it's spelled K-E-R-A-L-A, -A, uh, the state of Kerala. Um, so, um, you know, so I think that model is very interesting, um, but it has not been replicated anywhere else, unfortunately, because it also threatens, I think, uh, we've not managed real devolution of power to municipalities, even though it became law in 1992 in India, we still don't have real devolution of power from the state to the municipalities. So, the state always, the center believes the states can't do it. The state believes the municipalities can't do it. Uh, they don't have the capacity, you know. Uh, everyone thinks that the people can't do it themselves. Planners think, oh, people can't plan at all, you know. So this, this thing continues. <laughs> Though in reality, all you need is a little bit of help and a little bit of technical input, you know. And I think we could, we could then go ground up. Um, so just to share one last thing that right now in Kerala, I'm doing a small participatory uh, process for a small uh, municipality of 32,000 people. And we are, uh, you know, it's a completely, it's advisor. I mean, I'm just one of two advisors who are leading this process. Um, very fascinating. Uh, where we have said, we are not going to plan. You tell us what you want. And we are going bottom up. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just interesting how um, the mentality from, I, I believe the authorities of Mumbai, it's similar to the mentality that our authorities in Lima have. And I think that has to like be <laughs> reorganized uh, It's just the people that are actually think more globally and to connect the rural areas and to also care about their, their livelihood, right? Because that is all about that. That's why they're coming here to Lima because they're being displaced from their own homes Places. and their own jobs. And um, and it's very important, the, the agricultural factor of, they, they make uh, our country like our country because uh, Mumbai and India, they, they're producers of, various fruits and vegetables and in here we are also the same so it has to be protected uh in in it has to be i think it's fragmented because it actually they they only think about the cities and not the rural areas and how to connect them not only to make their you know their agricultural um uh the, the agricultural uh factor a 
like stronger, but also to help the, the people to to live with that, to 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 be able to survive, not even survive, to just make sure that they could keep that culture going and not actually like exterminating <laughs> and make them come to to the center and make more chaos, like and to get jobs. So it's 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 very interesting how everything is just it 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 is a it is like a story that it repeats in other places and it's very interesting that it happens in Mumbai as well. Um so yeah. Global capital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're, they're pushing more and more concrete everywhere. You know, I think it's the same story. It just yeah, sometimes it's just a little story. delay here, a little delay there, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. And everyone, you know, we all have the same colonial baggage. Yeah, that that yeah, <laughs> it's it's because um, I I think it happens. Yeah, exactly the, the colonial uh, situation. It, it's it's interesting how we have so much history and so much um, we have culture. Like I I don't think that a, a, a like um, we have a lot of as, I I don't know how to say it. Uh, tenemos um, Mucha historia, eh, como que una problemática, uh, like a colonial problematic, like uh, we have right. like a, a pro, like a problematic of identity as well. I think in Lima, um, right. when right. when we we left, like we we feel unconnected with some parts of our history, and yeah. and we and also that it's interesting how a lot of the, the history that we have. With colonialism and how um, how we do not connect with things that happened in our past, and that we we were left like like with like without a limb or something, so right. that translates also in how we manage to to write our our future, our history, and how I, it's just interesting how. Uh, we are so rich in culture, yet we do not get to uh, connect our our lands or our um, our cities, and that has to do a lot with also how we were, uh, how our history was was written in the past. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's totally great points. Great points. It, right. It's <laughs> yeah. Super that's super interesting because it's always connected to deeper things like identity yeah. like uh, history like culture and uh, i think uh, that's not something that is particular to peru but uh, the contrary right so yeah thank you carla for for that so i think we're a little with the time so uh, maybe you want to add something else uh, samantha but i think that this was it was super great uh, malini so i think i'm happy that we had the uh, we had you as a guest, so um, yeah, I don't know if Samantha, you want to add some last uh, remarks, maybe? Yeah, maybe just a, a short, I, I think we, uh, well, first of all, Malini, thank you so much for, for coming to our our class. I think it's been a, a super productive conversation. We've talked about uh, several different topics, but I think they all sort of come come together and, and some of the things that Stella was also mentioning right now also relate to like last class when we were talking about actually post-coloniality in planning and how the tradition of planning as a colonial act is also very, very important and how that also plays a part in this fragmentation of, of, of ideas and how also this, this new sort of ideas of of capitalism and capital develop and like capital accumulation and, and development in general, like this idea of this or this notion of, of development and for example, favoring the urban over the rural and how that also plays a part in how we divide what's being planned that where are the funds as you were saying for the case in, in India and how that plays a part between the division of sovereign and technical planning and I think so it all sort of there's a lot of different pieces that uh, I think we've touched upon in the class today but they are sort of all come together and, and are weaved into this understanding and this uh, very um, distinction be between dichotomies and different notions of how to uh, and also some ideas on, on how to move forward so 
Um, I think, um, I don't know, Jose Carlos, if you want to add something, but I think uh, it's been a, a wonderful conversation and we're very happy that you were able to join us today. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it was very, very special. I would have liked to see all your faces, but uh, uh, I don't know if I can coax you to turn on your videos before I leave. Just to, you know, it's very disheartening for people to see images. And, you know, that was one thing which I hated uh, during COVID and being online. So if right. I can see a few more faces, I'll be very happy. Uh, yeah, all but, of you. Yeah, all of you that uh, yeah, all of you that you can please uh, turn on your cameras and also let's give a round of applause to to <laughs> Thank you. Just finish. So thank you so much, Malini, and yeah, I thank hope you. Um, and one last thing that I want to say, uh, you know, we should talk even beyond the class because I also think just a conversation about similarities and differences. I know with Louis we had started something, uh, but the more we talk, you know, we realize that. There is so much to, so much similarity that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we really need uh, to write and think and think through these things. And I'm sure we, I have a lot to learn from the Nima example, because I've seen that your informal housing, at least there is sanitation, at least there is water. Thank you for those who are turning your videos. Thank you so much. It's great to see all of you and it's been wonderful. Uh, okay. So yeah, we should we should find ways to do this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we should be in contact and yeah, we will we'll find more opportunities. Yeah, yeah. there there are yeah. these there are these. Thank you there. guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malini. Yeah. Hope yes. We'll keep Bye. in touch. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.